scripture reading is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. The book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first. Or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews, but they are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Thus ends today's scripture passage. May his name be glorified. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this, <clears throat> for this morning time. We want to thank you, Father, for the opportunity to remember our Savior, remember his work on the cross of Calvary to offer our praise and thanksgiving to him, Father. We want to thank you, Father, for our Lord Jesus Christ and what he means to us. And we pray, Lord, that as we look into these words today, we pray, Lord, that you will um, turn our hearts again towards thee, Lord, towards how much we ought to love thee, Father. And we just give you all the glory and praise as we sit before you. We pray that we may do so with attentive hearts and minds, Father. We give to you all the glory in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Thank you, David, for reading that passage. Uh, uh, what we'll, um, we'll look at today is sort of based on this passage, but... You know, for those who are wondering, I'm not starting a series in Revelation, um, nor am I starting a series on the seven letters to the churches, okay? Um, this was just a passage that I happened to read this week in my own quiet time, and um, it sort of uh, gave me some direction in terms of what, uh, what I need to talk about. So we won't even be in, this, in the scripture uh, all of this morning, but, uh, but, but rather just use it as sort of a jumping off point to talk about something that I think is, is really important and, and needed for us. Uh, and you know, as I uh, was thinking about this message, I was reminded of, uh, of something, and maybe I've shared this story with you before, uh, you know, of a, of a young man who, who came to me once uh, some, some many years ago, and, uh, and he said, I want to talk to you. And, uh, and, uh, and I said, sure, what is it? And, and he said... Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going through some struggles. So I said, yeah, go ahead, tell me. Uh, and he said, you know, when I got saved, uh, you know, things were very different. You know, things were, were very different. I was, I, I felt an excitement. You know, I felt an excitement about going to church and about reading the word of God and about, uh, um, you know, just uh, being with, uh, with people in the church. I, I just, it was very different. And, uh, and now it's been, Many years, and I've uh, I just don't feel that anymore. You know, it doesn't feel the same way. It just feels sort of you know there there really is no excitement anymore. And uh, you know, as I read this passage, I was I was reminded of that and the fact that you know that's true with many of our lives. You know, perhaps you know in our Christian lives we go through ups and downs in terms of our uh, emotions, in terms of our uh, uh, devotion, in terms of our interest. Um, you know, and uh, and uh, and things uh, you know don't don't quite seem right sometimes. You know, we feel like it's a bit of drudgery that we are going through the motions, and um, you know, so so very often, depending on your background and how you came to know the Lord, perhaps you are 
very enthusiastic you know when you when you and you, and you can see this with new believers who come from say a, a hindu background or 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 a nominal christian background when they come to the lord and they are really enthusiastic and they want to tell people about the lord and they want to uh, be around the people of god and, and there's this 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 rush of excitement uh, that uh, that that envelops them and uh, and yet over time we find that that uh, you know they have that craving to know the lord but then over time that sort of wanes you know and and you just don't feel it anymore and that's sort of the picture that we find here uh, to some extent uh, about the, um, the 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 church in in Ephesus that uh, that I wanted to just use as an example to to talk about uh, something that I think is is very important for all of us and all of these letters to the uh, to the, um, the the seven churches you know were um, are really given there for for a reason and that is for us as as modern day churches to examine ourselves you know examine our own lives as individual believers examine where we stand as a church uh, and uh, you know we can probably find little bits of all of these uh, you know within our church uh, you know we have the, uh, the you know this church was the the loveless church and then you have the church of smyrna which is uh, the church that was going through persecution you have the church in pergamos that was going uh, that was that was compromising uh you know compromising the truths of the word of god then you have tyra which was completely corrupt you have uh, sardis which is uh, described as the church that was dead and then you have uh, philadelphia which is described as a faithful church and then it closes out uh, the message to the seven churches close out with the church of laodicea which was the lukewarm church now when i grew up you know i uh, i i grew up uh, listening to messages about these and it's very interesting how people interpret these these uh, message to the seven churches and and one of the things that um, uh, that uh, the one one line of interpretation is that you know each of these these churches represent uh, sort of seven ages of church history and so people would the preacher would try to present each of these and say you know the the ephesian church was the the early church from this you know from from 40 AD through some time and then then the next church you know smona represented this period and and i always found it very interesting uh, of course later on as i studied i came to realize that was that was probably not the right way to interpret it uh, but um, uh, but but anyway it was it was it was funny but uh, when uh, when they got to the church in philadelphia i heard one preacher once who who actually managed to find the brethren movement in the church in philadelphia um <laughs> which uh, which was interesting it was i guess it makes us all feel good to find the brethren church in prophecy uh, you know i love being part of the brethren church you know we have a great legacy i don't think we need to be in prophecy to be uh, to be appreciative of that legacy uh, but then over time i began to realize that really wasn't the right way to look at it you know because you find these characteristics and it doesn't really match up that that uh, you know well and you have to sort of force fit the the historical narrative into Uh, into the description of these seven churches to really try to make that work and the intent here was not that but rather to to present to show that these are all first century churches these seven that even within that in that first century you had all of these aspects in all of those churches and it's been the case uh, you know from uh, from the beginning of of church history all the way today that we have all of these things and as we look into this uh, i just want us to think about something you know when we when we look at um, at our lives when we look at um, you know believers around us um, you know perhaps there are sort of two or three groups that 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 we can we can group ourselves into you know there are and and predominantly two main groups and, and uh, you know you look at those there, there's a group who are basically just um, just going through the motions you know of, of being christian you know being believers that they do not give much priority to living the christian life and to seeking uh, god's will they essentially just uh, ignore christ so christ is just sort of an add on to their lives you know they fall victims to the culture they turn to empty worldly pursuits they want to be comfortable with the world you know there's a there's a well known hymn by um, by uh, fanny crosby Uh, that goes like this take the world but give me jesus all its joys are 
uh, are uh, uh, all joys are but I don't remember the exact words there. Uh, but basically, it says, you know, take the world away from me and give me the Lord Jesus. You know, and very often, you know, when you look at the way that 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 many believers live their lives, you know, they want they would like to change the words of that hymn to say, you know, give me the world, but also give me Jesus. Right? We want both. We want to try to balance the two. We don't want to give up the world, but we want to hold on to the Lord. And, and, and this group, you know, they've completely lost sight of the fact that loving Christ and living in obedience to Him is our ultimate responsibility. That is what we are saved to. That is what we are saved for. And then there's another group, which is um, those who are busy. You know, they're very busy in activities for the Lord. Uh, and nothing wrong with that, but they focus on doing the right things. They focus on, on uh, to the point, sometimes they're very legalistic, you know, and they, they, they look down on other people who are not doing that, those things. And, and then they, you know, we raise our children in spiritual uh, ways. We want them to be in Sunday school. We want them to memorize the verses. I know many, we have a lot of memory verse champions here from, from our uh, younger days, um, you know, who can recite all of Psalm 117 and, and um, you know, wonderful things, right? Um, what's that? Oh, that's the wrong one, right? Okay, you guys got it. That's an easy one. Okay. <clears throat> the really long one. Okay. All right. But anyway, um, you know, in the process, though, what happens is uh, this becomes sort of more habit, right? It doesn't really come from the heart. Uh, and, and they forget to maintain uh, a rich and loving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The labors become cold, uh, orthodox, they become mechanical, uh, and they believe and do all the right things, but in a very cold way. You know, very often it's sort of like a marriage. You know, you look at some marriages, um, you know, very often, and this typically happens after you've had kids, you know, one, two, three, uh, whatever, and, and you're a few years into your marriage, generally around you know, seven, eight years. You know, I, I loved uh, Prithvi's testimony yesterday. You know, he was, he was, he was actually very honest, uh, you know, and sharing with us how when, when the baby was coming, he was excited, but he started wondering if he'd be able to love Anvesha so much once the baby comes, you know. Um, uh, but, but he did a good job with that. So, uh, uh, you know, but the, the point is that there is a reality there. You know, you, life intrudes and, and over time, you know, you have the husband doing his thing and the wife doing her thing. And, and your focus becomes on the children and, and everything seems fine, right? Everything is going fine. You know, you make sure that there's things in the house to make sure there's money coming in. Uh, but there really is no real relationship. There is no love there, you know, between the husband and the wife, which is not the way that God intends it. So things are moving on fine. You know, everything seems to be fine in the family. The kids are growing up. They're getting educated. We're making enough money. We're meeting all our needs. We're going to church. We're doing all the right things. We're even engaged in activities. But there really is no bond. There really is no love. That first love has gone away. And that's what we see here in the Ephesian church. And then there's a third group, which is where really we really ought to be. And that's what we want to talk about today. And that is that all that we do, for the Lord is driven and motivated by a true love for the Lord. And that's what uh, the, uh, the message here to the church in Ephesus is about, is, is about your first love. So with that, let's just look at this. And here we see a, a group of Christians who sort of fell, fall into that second group that I described. And what do we see about them? Um, it says, starting in verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil and yet, and you have tested those who say uh, they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. So here we find a church that was very noble. We find a church that was established, uh, in, uh, ho that established holiness and righteousness as their standard. It says in verse 2 that, they, that you cannot bear those who are evil. They were doctrinally pure. They held on to the pure doctrine. Uh, we find that verse 2, that they were able to identify the false teachers. We find that verse 3, that they labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. They were busy doing stuff. They were working hard. They were not growing weary uh, of, of doing good. Uh, and then also in verse 3, we find that they have, uh, uh, it says that you have persevered and have patience. They have long-suffering, they have persevered perhaps 
through some difficulty, perhaps through persecution. Uh, but then after all of those things, you know, this seems like you look at this and you say, you know what, there's nothing wrong with this church. You know, what is wrong? They're busy doing things. They have, they're holding on to the right doctrines. They are, um, you know, they are, they are, they are uh, fighting against the, the false teachers. They are working hard. They are persevering through difficulties and trials. Then what is wrong? But the Lord says, nevertheless, I have this against you. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. You have left your first love. They had left. Another translation says that you have abandoned. You have abandoned your first love. And basically the problem with them was that their motivation for their works, you know, where they started off being motivated, they had that first love. That is the love they had for the Lord when, when, they, when, they, when they trusted in Him, when they came to salvation, that love had dissipated and now they were all about doing things and doing activities and, and, and being very mechanical uh, about it. Their motivation was not right. And, and uh, you know, when you look at the struggle in our life, you know, uh, in our camp, uh, Nate Bramson mentioned this, that we're talking about our struggle with sin, you know, our struggle with lust in, uh, in one of the workshops, that, that, um, that this is really, you know, fighting against lust is not about fighting uh, against sin, or fighting against lust, but it's about having a more intimate relationship with the Lord, right? It's, it's, it's not to be a negative thing, it's to be a positive thing, that when you have that intimate relationship with the Lord, then the works that flow out of it, the attitude that we have towards it, towards the things that we do, will be very different, and our results will be very different. And I want us to ask ourselves as we look at, the, at as we go into the message here today, you know, where do each of us stand in terms of our relationship with the Lord. Where do each of us stand? Have we lost our first love? Uh, or is it stronger than ever? Is it getting stronger? Uh, do we have a, a yearning to know more about the Lord and to become more like Him? And we'll even look at some of those verses that we saw in Philippians chapter 3 that we studied in camp. Verses 7 and 8, the Apostle Paul says, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. The surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. You know, Paul's drive was not about doing things, but about knowing Christ more and more. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them all, uh, count them but rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ. He wanted to gain Christ. Knowing Christ was the passion of Paul's life. Do we have that kind of a passion in our life? And you know, if our love for the Lord is not where it needs to be, you know, then how can we restore that first love? And how can we love Him more? And let's look at Re uh, Revelation chapter 2 verse 5. Uh, in this letter, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself gives this instruction to them. And He says three things there in this verse. Number f uh, verse 5. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now I'm not going to get into what it means to remove your lampstand and all of those things. That's, that was not my intent today. Uh, just, just take my word. It doesn't mean that you're going to lose your salvation. Okay? It, it means something else. Uh, but he says three things there. He says, first of all, remember from where you have fallen. Remember means go back you know, to where you started out. You know, this is what you had. Go back. Remember the person with whom you have this relationship. Remember who Christ is. Remember what you have in Christ. Remember what his work accomplished for you. Remember what he is doing for you now. So number one, remember. The second instruction is to repent. It says repent. You know, repent means to change direction. Repent is much more than just being sorry. It is to change direction to return to the first love the Lord Jesus Christ and then the third thing he says do the first works do the first works repeat or return return to the first works do the first works return to building your relationship with the Lord return to working on knowing him and growing in your love for him no it's very interesting that when you go to one of the other churches that is the um, uh, Revelation 3 the beginning of Revelation 3, which is the church of Sardis. And this is the church which 
unlike the um, uh, the Ephesian church, they were actually they were known as the dead church. Okay, the Ephesian church had a lot of works; they were quite alive. Uh, they were doing a lot of things, but they had lost their first love. And here is the dead church where they weren't really doing anything. And and look at the instruction that he has for them in uh, in verse. Uh, uh, let's see. I think it's the uh, yeah the church the the church at Sardis. He says. Uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to find my bearings here. Uh, But he gives the same instruction. There it is in verse uh, 3. Remember, therefore, how you have received. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. So you see here the remembrance and the repentance. It's the same command that he gives to both these churches in Sardis and Ephesians, in Ephesus. He gives the same command to the church that was dead and without works. The same command he gives to the church that was alive with works but had lost its first love. So that just gives us a hint that, you know, when our works are not motivated by our love for the Lord, uh, then, uh, you know, in the eyes of the Lord, they're the same thing. You know, he doesn't just want our works. He wants us to love him. He wants us to maintain that love for him. He wants our works to flow from our love for him. And how do we know if our works are coming from our love for the Lord? It really comes down to our motivation. It comes down to our attitude. You know, how do you view it when, when you're called upon to do something, how do you react to it? How do you respond to it? Do you do, it, do, do, you do it with a willing heart, you know, because you love the Lord, because your intent in your life is to please the Lord, or do you do it grudgingly because you think, you know, well, what's somebody going to think if I don't do this, or, or what kind of a testimony am I going to be if I don't do these things, or I'm not seen doing these things? No, what the Lord wants is for us to do the good works. That's what we were created for. You were created unto good works. You were saved unto good works. But he wants those to be motivated coming from our heart because of our love for the Lord. So I just want to spend a few minutes looking at these three things. You know, the three points here of how can we love the Lord Jesus more. If we are in that situation. And I want us to each examine ourselves. You know, three points. Remember from where you have come. Repent and then repeat or return to the first works. And what do we have to remember? And really when we are talking here about our love for the Lord, it's really all about remembering the Lord. And so, you know, this might be a little basic, uh, but I want to remind us of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. You know, sometimes the way that, you know, once we are saved and we go about uh, our lives, we tend to forget who the Lord Jesus Christ is. We tend to forget who we have, we have uh, you know, what he has done for us. And that's why it's so beautiful that we get to come week after week and remember the Lord because the purpose of this coming here is not a ritual. It is really to help us to remember and the Lord, I believe, he instituted this feast and and we do it week after week for this very reason so that we can go back and remember what he has done for us so that we will not go cold in that love for him. Let's look at who it is that the Lord Jesus Christ is. First point is that Jesus is our God, that he is God. You know, we were reminded this morning... uh, uh, Kishore was telling us about, uh, about uh, you know, the, the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? But he was God. Yes, he was human, but he was also God. He was not just any ordinary man. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 1 and, and look at a few things about the Lord Jesus Christ. And really what I want to do here is, is do nothing more than just point us to some scriptures and, 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 and do a little bit of a refresher here, you know, of, of who the Lord Jesus Christ is so that we might... Uh, renew our minds, renew our understanding of who he is and it might enable us to, uh, to really uh, love him more. First, verse 15 of Colossians 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. All Please the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Jesus Christ, he is God. He is a preeminent one. He is the climax of God's revelation the full representation of who God is revealed to us in the form of a man. He's a human, the complete human expression of God 
Almighty. He's superior to and exalted above everything and anything. And look at the relationship uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ with the Father. Verse 15 says, He is the image of the invisible God. He is one with the Father. He is God. He is no less God than the Father is God. Secondly, He is the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person. We find that in Hebrews 1 and verse 3. Let's just go read uh, Hebrews as well. Hebrews 1 verses, first three verses. Also talks about the, uh, in similar terms about the Lord Jesus Christ. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged us and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. What a wonderful description of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's a brightness of the glory of God. He's the express image of the person of God. It pleased the Father that in him all his fullness should dwell. He is fully God. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2 and verse 9. He is the heir of all that God possesses. Uh, the firstborn over all creation. This is not talking about birth, but it's talking about his, his ranking, his position. Uh, it, it, it's, it's his position is that's the position of the firstborn. He has inherited all these things. He, is the, he has a right to rule over all that God possesses. Hebrews 1-2 says, He has appointed him heir of all things. Ultimately, everything in the universe is destined to come under the control of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came once as a poor man. You know, he became poor so that we might become rich, but he will return as a ruler and everything will be put in subjection under him. Romans 8, 16 and 17 says, We are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. What is Christ doing for us? What has he done for us? He has given us this joint possession of all that Christ possesses. God has given us joint possession with Christ of all that he has given to Christ. And then in these same verses, it talks about his relationship to creation. He is the creator. It says, by him all things were created. He is not merely a part of creation. He is not by any means a created being. But he is the very creator. Through whom also he made the worlds. Hebrews 1, 2. The worlds, the ages, everything was created through him. He pre-exists. He is before all things. That passage we read in Colossians tells us that he is eternally existing. He is before all things. Uh, Micah 5.2 as his verse says, His goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. He had no beginning, he had no end. He is the eternal one. And not only that, Colossians 1.17 tells us he is the sustainer. He is not just the creator, but he keeps everything going. The way the world keeps on working. It says, in him all things consist. That means everything holds together in Christ. He is upholding all things by the word of his power. We read in Hebrews 1.3. Upholding, he is supporting, he is maintaining all things by his power. And then, what is Jesus' relationship to the church? He is the head of the body, the church. Colossians 1.18. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. The firstborn from the dead. The Lord Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. He became the firstborn he says that, so that he may lead many sons to glory. He controls, he directs, he produces unity. He gives spiritual gifts to his body, the church. He is the source. It said, from who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He chose us in him. Ephesians 1 verse 4. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He has set us apart and brought us into this body that he treasures called the church, his bride. He is the one who is the preeminent one in the church. That is who the Lord Jesus Christ is. He is the God's agent in salvation. How, how should we respond to this? You know, Jesus Christ, our Savior, he is God. He is God. How do we respond? We've got to acknowledge that and give him the first place in everything, including in our lives. We do not occupy a position of preeminence. You know, very often, you know, we are so selfish. We want to just look at life from our perspective. But when we realize having that love for the Lord means giving him the preeminent position that he deserves because he is God and for no other reason. The object of our love, 
he's no ordinary person. He's not a human being. It's not like a husband and a, and a wife loving each other, but it is, it is God Almighty uh, that we worship, God Almighty that we are to love. And if our love for him has gone cold, could it be because we have forgotten who he is? Is it because of, of that distance that has come between us and him that we have really forgotten who this is? This is no ordinary man. This is no person. This is God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ. The second point of who Jesus is, is that he remember, that we have to remember is not only that he is God, but he is our savior. He is our savior. Philippians 2 verses 5 to 8. I'm not going to go there. You all know that those verses. He humbled himself and became a man for us. You know, he didn't just, uh, you know, that's what that, that passage says. You know, he did not consider equality with God something to be held on to. You know, if that was all, if, if he was just, you know, God, that would be enough for us to have that, that love relationship with him. But he went far beyond that. He made himself a man and he humbled himself unto death. It says, Philippians 2.70, that he emptied himself. He emptied himself. He made himself of no reputation. He became a man and he identified with sinners. He came in the likeness of men, of sinful men. No, he had no sin and yet, but he did come in the body of man and he humbled himself. He took the character of a servant. Why? He did that for you and for me so that he might become our savior. He humbled himself and he was obedient, verse Philippians 2 and 8, to the point of death, even death on the cross. We read about that, that scene in the Garden of Gethsemane where it says, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And then he suffered for us. The pattern of his suffering you know, is an example. Let's turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse... Uh, 21. First Peter 2 and 21. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his footsteps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. He committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he died. He did not threaten. He committed himself to who? To God Almighty. He is our example. You look at his pattern of suffering. And suffering is a reality in life, especially for the Christian. Suffering is God's way of making us spiritually mature. And we have to view our trials from the perspective of, uh, of the Lord's suffering, the fact that the Lord's suffering. That's why when the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3 he talks about knowing Christ, he also talks about knowing his sufferings and, and making those sufferings our own. Jesus suffered for us. He humbled himself and became a man. He suffered for us. Remember, remember this Jesus who became your savior. And then he became our substitute. We were dead in our sins and transgressions and our trespasses. We were separated from God, it says in Ephesians 2 and 1. We were the objects of God's wrath, Ephesians 2 verse 3, but Christ has saved us from the wrath of God. He, he took our place. He paid the penalty. That's what we are here to remember. And yet I wonder how much this we really grasp this each week as we come, how much we grasp this to the point that it really impacts our thoughts, impacts our actions, this love for the Lord. He was our perfect sacrifice. What is our response to him? What is our response to the Lord as we remember that he is not only God, but he became my savior, my personal savior, your personal savior. Christ's work on our behalf. He humbled himself and became a man. He suffered for us on the cross. He became our substitute, bearing God's wrath on our behalf. God gave his life, gave up the life of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as a perfect sacrifice to make us righteous before God. Christ, the God of the universe, willingly gave up his own life. He gave up so much for us. What do we, what ought we to do for him in return? How, there's a hymn that goes, how can I help but love him when he loved me so? How can I help but love him when he loved me so? Jesus Christ, not only our God, but also our Savior. And if that wasn't enough, you know, the important, the one more point here with regard to what we have to remember about Jesus is that he is not just God and he is not just our savior, but 
you know, he's not just, it's not that he died and he rose again, he's just sitting there doing nothing. But today, he is working on our behalf. He is our high priest and our advocate. He was exalted, Philippians 2, 9 says, he was exalted and given a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow on heaven and earth and under the earth. In Romans 8, verse 34, let's turn to Romans 8 and 34. It tells us what Christ is doing for us today. Romans 8 and 34. Who, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who makes intercession for us. He's at the right hand of God. You know, we read that he's seated at the right hand of God. It's not that he's seated at the right hand of God, just enjoying uh, the position, the privilege. You know, he's not that he's sitting there saying, hey, I went and did my thing and I'm sitting over here, you know, relaxing. No, he is interceding for us as our high priest, as our advocate with the Father, John. First John 1 says that if we sin and we confess our sins, we have an advocate with the Father. This Lord Jesus, he is over there, seated at the right hand of God. Every time you sin and every time I sin, he is advocating for us, saying, look, I died for him, I died for her, I shed my blood. Forgive him, forgive her. The Lord Jesus Christ, he is not just God. He is not just our savior. He is our high priest. What is our response? His ministry didn't just end at the cross. He is continuing to work on our behalf. You know, we are, we are the, the, uh, in a line of people who are resurrected from death into life. And he is there as the firstborn from the dead interceding for us. Do we need any more reason to love him? We need to remember who the Lord Jesus Christ is. You know, going back to the church in Ephesus, he says, remember from where you have fallen. Remember the love that you had. You have lost your first love. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember who he is. He is God. He is your savior. He is your high priest and advocate. He is real. Ought not you love him? What can I do but love him? How can I help but love him when he loved me so? But then there's one more thing. It's not just enough to remember, but we have to repent. Repent of our sins. You know, have we been diverted from our first love for the Lord by worldly priorities? You know, we know now who Christ is. We've been reminded. Once you remember who Christ is, in order to return to that first love, we need to repent of our failures. We need to repent of that failure, not of individual sins, but repent of our failure to love the Lord. The fact that, you know, when we sin, it is because of not having that intense love, that intimate love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just want to use uh, the Apostle Peter here as an example. You look at the life of Peter. We all, we all know the history of Peter. He was an interesting character. You know, Peter, uh, what was his failure? You know, you look at Peter, he was... He was, he, he, he was a boaster. You know, he, he thought much of himself, you know, when the Lord Jesus Christ talked about him, denying himself, uh, denying him three times. He says, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Mark 14, 31, he says that when the, the Lord said, no, this is going to happen, he said, even more vehemently. And he says, even if I have to die with you, Matthew 26, 35, I will not deny you. You know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter, he was supposed to stay up and pray. You know, but what happened? He fell asleep along with the other disciples. And he was very impulsive when the, when the uh, you know, the Lord had told them that he had to go to Jerusalem and he had to die and, and, and shed his blood for the, for the sins of mankind. But when the, the uh, soldiers came to, uh, to uh, you know, to, to arrest the Lord Jesus Christ, what does Peter do? He was such an impulsive character, you know. Such an impulsive character, he cut off the man's ear. You know, he refused to accept that it was God's plan for his master, the Lord Jesus Christ, to go, to suffer, and to die. And then he compromised. You know, you see him wandering around in that, in that courtyard of the, of the high priest, denying the Lord. You know, he knew that he should have left there. He knew it was a place of danger. After the first one, where he says, no, 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 I do not know him. He did not leave. He still hung around there. And then Peter collapsed. He kept denying the Lord Jesus Christ. He kept saying, I do not know him. When somebody said, yes, for sure, I saw you with him. He says, no, I do not know him. His denials kept increasing in intensity. And then after that third denial, when that rooster crowed, 
the cock crowed, Peter remembered what the Lord had said and his soul must have just burned deep into his conscience by the evil of what he had done, that he had denied the Lord that he loved so much. And, and you go to Matthew 26 and verse 75, we see Peter, the beginning of Peter's repentance there. Uh, Matthew 26 and verse 75. It says that he went out and he wept bitterly. He went out and he wept bitterly. That is the first sign of repentance here. Matthew 26 and verse 75. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus. He said immediately, let's go to 74. Then he began to, and look at this, he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. That's the depth to which Peter had gone. Immediately, a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. When he realized his sin, he had such deep remorse. But you know what's interesting about Peter is, is uh, if we can just turn to the Gospel of John, you know, that point of repentance wasn't the final restoration of Peter. Because we see that after that, Peter... And uh, along with Peter, several other disciples, they, they sort of give up. You know, they give up. And they go back to their old trade. They go back to fishing. Um, John 21, after these things, uh, you know, verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. So we see here Peter... You know, he, he was probably, if you, if you put yourself in Peter's shoes, here he was, the one who had boasted, the one who said, I will never leave you. If everyone leaves you, you know, I will still be there. And, and absolutely not vehemently he denied uh, that, uh, that he would ever uh, deny the Lord Jesus. Even if I have to die, uh, you know, I will not deny you. Uh, you know, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. He says, I will be there to the very end. And, and when, that, when that rooster crowed, and he realized how much he had failed the Lord. Uh, you know, it, it must have had such an emotional toll on him. And Peter sort of must have felt that his life wasn't worth it anymore. There was no point going and working from, for Jesus anymore. There was no point, um, you know, living that life anymore. And so what does he do? He goes back to his old life, the life of a fisherman. And not only that, you know, he, he says, uh, I am going fishing. You know, and what happened? The rest of them said, we are going with you. And you know how often this is what happens. You know, when, when we uh, pull back, you know, when we lose that first love, you know, when we haven't been fully restored and we are not willing to, to do what the Lord wants us, to show our love for him by serving him, then we also pull others down with us. And that's what often happens in, in church life, isn't it? And we see here that, that, um, that it leads him back to fishing. As time passed, his love had grown cold again. And, uh, you know, and what happens here, he goes and he catches no fish. But then, amazingly, the Lord comes back. The Lord wants to restore him back. And the Lord, the Lord knows that he was sorry, but he knew that he needed another push, another, another, another boost up to get uh, restored. And then, uh, you know, it tells us here in, um, you know, that, that the Lord Jesus Christ came and, uh, uh, you know, he says, uh, children, have you any food? They answered him, no, verse 6. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it because of the multitude of fish. What was the Lord Jesus Christ doing there? You know, you remember back in, in Luke chapter 5, you know, the very first time the, the, the Lord comes and he's calling his disciples. You know, there's the same scene there. The very first time they're out all night and they're catching fish and the Lord Jesus Christ uh, ask them, have you caught any fish? In Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 11. And they say, no, we haven't caught anything. He says, okay, cast your net on the other side. And they say, but Lord, we've been working all night. You know, how we, there's nothing there. We, we, we are the expert, the fishermen. You know, we've been trying all night. And he says, no, just go ahead and cast. And they cast the net and, and they pulled up. There was more fish than they could even gather. And then Peter goes and falls before the Lord back then in Luke chapter 5. And here's the Lord going all the way back, taking them back, saying, do you remember? Do you remember? You know, in case you've forgotten, let me remind you who I am. You know, I am the one who can command the fish to fill your nets 
beyond what you can imagine. I am the Lord of the universe. And, uh, you know, Christ initiates there the restoration of Peter. He wanted to know if Peter loved him more. And then he comes and he has this wonderful dialogue with Peter where he asked Peter three times, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? You know, and the Lord comes there asking, you know, he wanted to know if Peter loved him more than his own life, more than fishing, more than all of these other priorities. And he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? You know, what was he talking about? I don't think, sometimes we think he's talking about these other disciples. I think he's talking about the fish and all of these other things. Do you love me more than all of these things that are pulling you away from me? And the Lord asks him, do you love me? The word he uses is agape. Do you love me? Do you agape me? Do you sacrificially love me? And Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And it's too bad it doesn't come, come across in the, in the English too well. But in the Greek it does. He says that I phileo you. You know, I have phileo love. That's just affection. Yes, Lord, I have affection for you. And then he says, feed my lamb. He says, again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Do you agape me? And Peter can't get himself. He says, how can I? How can I say that I... I, I love the Lord sacrificially when I just denied him, when I just left him, when I disowned him in his time of need. How can I say that? And he says, yes, Lord. <clears throat> he said to him again a second time, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You know, you know that I love you. I have affection for you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And then Peter just couldn't handle it says Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And then he can't even, he can't even say, uh, come back and say, Lord, I have affection for you. He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. You know, Peter's restoration is complete. The Lord comes after him. This sheep that had gone away, that had disowned him, that had denied him. And he says, you follow me. You follow me. You will. You know, I have great things planned for you. You know, I know you love me. I know your heart. You know, you will die, uh, you know, in this manner. You will suffer and die for me. Um, you will glorify God by the manner of your death. And he says, follow me. His restoration was complete. You know, have we grown so cold in our, in our love for the Lord? If so, just like Peter, we need to repent. We need to weep bitterly. We need to come back. And the Lord is seeking us out. He wants to restore us. You know, I don't know where you are at this point in your Christian walk. Maybe, maybe you are beset by the sins of the past. Maybe they are holding you back from loving the Lord, the Lord wants you to come back just as he restored Peter. He's seeking you out. He's saying, don't go back to those things. Come back. You know, I still love you. I died for you. I am your high priest. I am interceding for you. Come back to me. Finally, the third thing, you know, after uh, remember and repent is to repeat. You know, it's not enough to just stop there. You've got to go back. You've got to go back to the first works. The maximum effort, Philippians 3.12 says, But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. We, we talked about this for three days last month. We've got to focus on the goal of attaining Christ-likeness. Go back. You know, it's not enough to just say, You know what? I'm not worthy. I've done these wrong things. You've got to first remember who the Lord is. You've got to repent. You've got to come back to Him. And then you've got to repeat, return to what the Lord wants you to do. Focus on the goal of attaining Christ-likeness. Forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God, God in Christ Jesus. Paul's motivation was all spiritual, not worldly. His prize was the upward call of God. That's what he lived for. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Not, not to make a name for himself. And then we've got to have consistent, progressive effort. Philippians 3.16 To the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. So if you think you have attained something for the Lord, don't rest, don't stop, keep going, keep fighting, keep 
progressing toward the goal? What can we do to successfully pursue Christ, to return, to repeat, come back to those things that show our love for the Lord, that flow out of our love for the Lord. Meditate on Christ, on who he is, on what he has done. Let's always go back and remember our relationship with the Lord. It's not just any ordinary relationship. Read and study the scriptures. It is a source of all knowledge about our Savior. Pray and ask God for a greater love in our life. Build up your faith. We can only love Christ by faith. Be filled with the Spirit. Submit our every action to the control of the Holy Spirit. Develop a hatred for sin by, by building up your intimacy, intimacy of your relationship with the Lord. Watch for sin. Pray against it. Confess it when it does occur. Associate yourself with those who have a love for the Lord. You know, what do we need to do more than anything else to continue growing in the Christian life? We need to remember who he is. Who is the one that we follow? Who is the one that we ought to be in love with? We need to repent of how far we have fallen. And then finally, we need to return. Have a rich, loving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, loving Jesus Christ is what the Christian life is all about. It's not about doing stuff. The stuff comes out of that love for the Lord. It's not, you know, the Christian Christianity is not a religion. It is an intimate, personal relationship with a person. <coughs> the Lord Jesus Christ. Such a relationship can only be as strong as the love that we have for that person with whom we have the relationship. And obedience to Christ and the word is a result of our love for the Lord. John 14, 23 says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. You know, we show our love <coughs> for the Lord by our obedience to him. It is not the other way around. You know, we don't do the things simply because we have to please somebody, but we do them because we love him. I trust that the Lord will enable each of us to examine where we are in our walk with him, how much we love the Lord. Have we, like that Ephesian church, have we fallen, um, you know, have we, uh, forgotten our first love have we <coughs> lost that first love and we need to come back to him we need to remember from where we have fallen we need to remember our savior and who he is and what he has done for us and what he is doing for us we need to repent and then we need to return to him return to taking his direction for our life return to 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 those loving acts of service to him uh, you know motivated by our love for him. May God enable us to do that. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word and for reminding us, Lord. We pray, Lord, that all of these things that we find, Lord, that were wrong with the, uh, the seven churches, Lord, that, uh, that, that we would examine our own lives, Father. We pray that it may not be said of us, Lord, that we have lost our first love, that we have forgotten our first love. And if we have, Lord, we pray that we may repent, that we may return, we may, we may remember uh, our Savior, just as we do week after week, that it would not just be a, a ritual, Father, of just taking bread and taking and drinking from the cup, but it would be a, a, a vehicle, Lord, a symbol that will draw us back to realizing what Christ has done for us, Lord. Lord, I want to pray for those who are lethargic in their walk, those who are here only because uh, they want to please somebody. Maybe they want to please their father or mother or their, uh, you know, their family, Lord. Maybe they're here for all the wrong reasons, Father. I pray, Father, that you will confront them. I pray for each of us, Lord, each of us, myself included, to examine <coughs> our love for you. Lord, that we may turn to you, that we may, we may just return, Father, to that intimacy in our walk with you, that we may not be like the married couple after so many years, Lord, that are just going about their business and <coughs> making sure that everything happens on time and, and, and without any problems, but have lost that love and intimacy for each other. I pray, Lord, that each of us may examine the depth of our love for you, our relationship with you, Father, so that we may return to you. We may return to the first works. We may return to our first love, Father, and, and that we may look at that first before we, we try to fix the problem, Lord, by just doing things, Lord, doing more things, that our actions may flow from the right motive, a motive of pleasing the one we love, because... We love him so much. We just give you all the glory and the praise. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.